And let me read this part. This is actually what Haman said to King Xerxes. There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. His customs are different from those of all other people and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. So if you're in covenant with God, then God calls you a peculiar people and you should be strange, different from the rest of the world. That means you should be doing these things like keeping the Sabbath holy and obeying his commandments and, you know, keeping the feast days. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. Yusha said, if the world hates you, remember, it hated me first. If you belong to the world, then the world would love you, because the world loves its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember these words the words I have spoken to you. If the world persecuted me, they will persecute you. And he who hates me hates my father as well. The same applies to Haman. His hatred wasn't just of the Jews, but he hated God and God's covenant. And he was driven by Satan. A sign that you're really obeying God is when people hate you and persecute you and say all kinds of manner of evil against you. Chapter 4, I'm in chapter 4. So Mordecai persuades Esther that, okay, she needs to intercede on behalf of the Jewish people. So that's when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he only, he only went as far as the king's gate because no one in sackcloth was allowed to enter. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews. With fasting, weeping, and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. And so Mordecai urged Esther to go and to the king's presence and beg for mercy. So this is what he told her, and this is something that is often quoted. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, help, relief, and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so she agrees, and she asks, she requests that all the Jews fast for three days. And she, this is what she said, When this is done, the fasting, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And she goes into the king against the law, but the king was pleased with her. And he said, what is your request? Up to half of the kingdom, I will grant it to you. This is chapter 5, by the way. Her request is to have a banquet. She invites the king and Haman. Naturally, Haman goes and he's like, in great spirits. You know, the queen just held a banquet and invited the king and Haman. And so at that banquet, the king is like, you know, okay, what's your request? I'll give you up to half of the kingdom. And Esther's request is to have another banquet. And again, she invites the king and Haman. Obviously, that did something to his ego. He goes back home and he's boasting to his wife about what a great life they have and he's got all these ten sons and he's rich and he's so powerful and he says, but nothing, none of this gives me satisfaction as long as I have to see Mordecai the Jew. And so his wife suggests that he build a gallows to hang Mordecai on. Chapter 6. One night the king, he couldn't sleep, so he asked some of his servants to read the chronicles about Mordecai the Jew that records how he uncovered the secret plot to kill the king, but he was never rewarded. And so the king decides that he needs to reward him. Meanwhile, Haman is coming in because he wants to hang Mordecai. The king hears him and says, oh, who's that? It's Haman. And Haman comes in and the king says to him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? And so, of course, Haman is like thinking that the king wants to honor him. So, of course, he thinks of like the best thing possible. And he says, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse. The king has ridden one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And so then the king commands Haman, go at once and do this for Mordecai the Jew. 
<laughs> this really makes him an angry, especially because the king said, do not neglect anything you have recommended. And so then him goes home and he, after this whole, you know, honoring Mordecai thing, and he goes home to his wife and he complains to her and he's pretty distressed and humiliated considering he had to honor his mortal enemy in public. And in his conniving ways had to made that, you know, that decree to annihilate the Jews, including Mordecai, the man the king just delighted to honor. And so his wife says, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. And boy, was she right. And so while they're still talking, the king's men come to take Mordecai to the second banquet. But I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens at the second banquet because I'm short of time and you should read the book of Esther for yourself. You already get the idea that the Jews have the victory, but the mechanisms and how it happened, you'll have to read it yourself. Usually Purim falls in March. This year on the rabbinical calendar it falls in March, but sometimes the rabbinical calendar is not accurate. Even though it's based on what the Bible says, it is a predetermined calendar, it's a fixed calendar. Whereas the Bible says that each new month should be determined by the sighting of the new moon, the rabbinical calendar already uh, kind of predicts how long each month will be, but it's not always perfect. And also, sometimes the Hebrew calendar has leap years. The rabbinical calendar predetermines when the leap years will be, but you really don't know until you see whether or not the barley harvest appears. So sometimes the rabbinical calendar is a full month off. This year, according to the new moon setting and then the Aviv harvest, Purim is February 17th and 18th, so it begins on the 16th at sundown. But on quickly now to how to celebrate Purim. So apart from reading the Book of Esther, which I've mentioned, um, it's good to actually read it ahead of time so you're familiar with the story and so that you're not just celebrating something that you don't really know what you're doing, you don't really know what you're celebrating. So it's good to know the story ahead of time, to read it. And the Book of Esther also tells you how to celebrate it with feasting, rejoicing, and gift giving. Also giving gifts to the poor. A very sad point, however, is that in, in Jewish Orthodoxy there is a false doctrine, a very sad false doctrine, an excuse to sin. They use Purim to, as an excuse to sin. And they teach that it is not only okay, but it is a mitzvot, a commandment to drink unto the point of intoxication on Purim. So much so that you cannot tell the difference between the words blessing Mordecai or cursing Haman. So in a sense, it's like saying drink until you don't know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, obedience and disobedience. The Bible is very clear that there are blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And there's certainly a curse on this practice, drinking to the point of intoxication and calling it something holy when it is not. Woe unto those who call good evil and evil good. So this religious orthodox idea has also been grasped onto by the secular Israeli culture. And there are these parades, known as Ad Yada, which is Hebrew for until you don't know. As in until you don't know, the difference between blessing Mordecai and cursing Haman. And that actual phrase comes from the writing of some rabbi. So some of these Ad Yada parades are more family oriented, but some of them are more like Mardi Gras or Carnival and an excuse to sin and party hard, which is not the point of this time. It should be a holy time really, in a time of joy, of holy joy and holy celebration. Another thing that the rabbis teach, that I actually agree with, is uh, the sages say that Purim is a day like Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur is a day like Purim. Yom Kippur, for those who don't know, is one of the high holy days. It's considered the holiest day, the most holy day of, of the year of the Jewish calendar. In English, it means Day of Atonement. And it's a day when you fast, you mourn for your sins, you repent, and you wear white. 
this is just examples of what you do. Um, but for those of us who have atonement for our sins in the Messiah Yahushua HaMashiach, there is not a sadness on this day, unless you're repenting for some serious sins. There is joy on this day, knowing that your sins are covered. But let me get this straight. I'm not saying that you use that as an excuse to sin. Of course, you have to live holy. And so Yusha forgives you of your past sins, and then you do your best to live holy. Of course, no one's perfect, but you're not going to intentionally sin. And you do have power to live holy by the, na the power in the name of Yusha and in the, in the power of his blood. Nonetheless, Yom Kippur is a very holy, somber day. It's very serious. Poem, even though it's a time of festivities and joy, it's still a very serious event that is being celebrated. A genocide was averted, and the Jewish people were s still preserved. Poem, the Jews are saved from annihilation. On Yom Kippur, souls are saved, sins are atoned for. Yom Kippur in the Bible is called Yom HaKippurim which literally means Day of Atonements. However, phonetically, it also sounds like the words a day like Purim, which is Yom HaKippurim, a day like Purim. So that's, that's the kind of idea that blossoms, and there's more revelation. They're both a celebration um, or a memorial of intercession. So Esther interceded for the Jewish people. On Yom Kippur, the high priest intercedes for the Jewish people. Poem is a time, it will be a transition time between the Great Tribulation and the Messianic Age, so it's also a time of judgment. Yom Kippur is a time of judgment after the Messianic Age, but they're both very similar. Um, the Great Tribulation will likely begin on a Yom Kippur and will end perhaps on a Purim or around a Purim. And the Messianic Age, the seventh millennial day, will end with a Yom Kippur. So all the holy feasts have prophetic significance in this fashion. For example, just the weekly Shabbat, the seventh day of the week, points to the seven millennial days, the seventh millennium, the seventh day, 1,000 year as a day, is the Messianic age, and there's 6,000 years before that. So the holy feast days and the appointed times that God has are so rich with meaning. And when you celebrate them, you're acknowledging this greatness of God and His providence that He has preordained everything, that He has all of history, past, present, and future mapped out. Um, and the Holy Feast often mirror events in our own lives. For example, this ministry, Alpha and Omega, Alpha and Tav, Almighty Wind, Ruach HaKadosh, Holy Ghost Fire, Last Chance Ministry, is in need of your prayers. Just as Mordecai besought Esther to petition the king, I ask you to pray and intercede for this ministry and help in any way that you can. Just as Mordecai said to Esther, I say to you, who knows, but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For if you remain silent at this time, help, relief, deliverance will arise from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. With the measure you measure out to this ministry, God will measure back to you. If you are a blessing to this ministry, God will bless you. If you turn a deaf ear to this ministry, God will do the same unto you. And so for your own sake, we will pray and lift up this ministry, that we would have victory over our enemies, that we would have relief from our enemies, that we would have wisdom with how to deal with the lawsuit that we are presently undergoing. We know that we have the victory, but God is testing his people to see who will pray. And so I ask you to pray on this Purim and to lift up this ministry, to fast and pray as you're led during this Purim season, and to support this ministry in any way that you can. And when God brings the victory, he will also bring the victory for you in the areas where you need it. So another way to celebrate, to keep pouring, and this is also kind of related to Yom Kippur, is with prayer and intercession. Wherever you see the need to intercede, then go for it. Um, the Bible says, 
in the book of Hebrews that we can come boldly before the throne of God because we don't come in our own name, in our own power, in our own anointing, in our own righteousness. We come with the righteousness of the Messiah, Yahushua, Yahweh's salvation. He was the perfect, sinless, holy Lamb of God. And it's His blood that atones for our sins. And so there, it's like Yom Kippur. It's the same idea. On that day, the high priest could go into the most holy place because he had the blood that atoned for sin. And he was atoning for the sin of all Israel. And so we can go any time before the throne of God because of this. Because the veil in the temple was rent, it was torn because when the Messiah, Yahushua, died and he atoned for our sins and when you uh, accept him into your heart as Lord, Savior, Master, you obey him, you live pleasing unto God, then his blood atones for your sin. And so on Purim, another way to commemorate this day is to beseech God, to petition him for wherever, whatever there is need. And so you go before the throne in humility and you pray. You pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You pray for the coming of the Prince of Peace, knowing that before he will come, there will be atrocities in the earth. And you're praying for the protection of the people of God. You're praying about the future events. You pray to be holy. You pray to be accounted worthy to be part of Yahushua's bride. So please visit amedywin.com or almightywin.com to read more about Purim. And there's more details about how to celebrate Purim and um, how to come before the throne of God on that day in prayer. And to read the prophecies about Purim, especially Prophecy 83, which gives a lot of revelation about the end times.